Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Jim Liker, Professor of History, and I am Director of the Kansas Studies Institute here at Johnson County Community College. I want to thank all of you for attending, and I especially want to thank our speakers, from whom you'll be hearing more throughout the day. Um, first, a word or two of explanation as to how this came to be. JCCC is now the largest undergraduate institution in the state of Kansas. We serve more than 20,000 students, both online and on ground. Given the increasingly central role that JCCC plays, not just in Johnson County, but statewide, President Terry Calloway in 2009 initiated the creation of the Kansas Studies Institute which is designed to better promote knowledge and understanding about the politics, the art, the literature, the history, and the cultures of the state of Kansas, which brings us to today's event. I'll let Dr. Vince Miller, director of the Educational Technology Center and my co-director of this symposium, explain more of the specifics, but I would like to briefly mention some of the Institute's ongoing activities. Since its inception, the Institute has sponsored an annual lecture series, which brings to campus prominent individuals whose life work is relevant to all in the state. The series has included notables like Wes Jackson, head of the Land Institute in Salina, filmmaker Kevin Wilmot, journalist Bill Curtis, and earthwork artist Stan Hurd, who has been commissioned to create an original piece of landscape art on the west part of campus. That project is happening in collaboration with students and faculty from areas like horticulture, art, art history, sustainability, and American Indian studies. A number of faculty, myself among them, also teach a series of continuing education classes for adult learners focusing on Kansas themes like ecology, Midwestern art, literature, weather, and water use. Those sessions have been taped and they air frequently on JCCC television. On that front, Kansas Studies has produced a film documentary about the life and work of folk sculptor M.T. Liggett, a production that has aired on a number of PBS stations and incidentally is for sale in the Nerman Museum gift shop, just right over there, blatant plug. I invite you all to return here to JCCC on February 12th and 13th for our next Kansas series lecturer, Cheryl Brown Henderson, who will be speaking about the legacies of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas case and its significance for race in America. Many people have contributed greatly to the planning and preparation of today's set of events, so I'm sure to omit some names. But I extend a special thank you to the staff and organizational development division and the foreign language department who are co-sponsoring, to the staff of the Rainier Center for the use of this fine facility, to the many technicians in the back who are helping today with audiovisual, to Julie Haas's publicity team, and most especially to the excellent chefs and servers, and servers who are gonna teach us diversity of food uh, the descriptions of which you can find on the backs of your program. So make sure to sample the free offerings um, throughout the day. What I think we've assembled today is a group of fine teachers who will enlighten us about the diversity of the people of Kansas through the languages that they speak. I hope that you'll find today's session stimulating. I hope you find us hospitable and generous. I hope you'll take the opportunity, if you can, to walk about the campus in which we take great pride and mostly, I hope you just have a good time. Again, welcome to the Kansas Language Symposium. I'd like to invite Dr. Larry Reynolds, Dean of the Communications Division, to say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> good morning. I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, the staff, the administration, the students, uh, more specifically, the Communications Division, and most specifically, the Foreign Language Department welcome you to this Kansas Language Symposium. Before I get too far into it, I do want to introduce someone really quickly. Uh, Carrie, if you could stand up for a moment here. Carrie Stevenson is the chair of the Foreign Language Department, and she's a professor of Spanish here, so give a welcome to Carrie. Appreciate it. 
You know, here at JCCC, we, we really believe in the teaching of foreign languages, and um, part of that is demonstrated by something somewhat unusual for a community college, and that is that we have a, a wide array of languages that we offer. And if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'm going to tell you how many languages we offer here for credit at the college. And if I forget, Carrie, you're going to help me, uh, right? We're going to go through this. So for credit here at the college, we offer Spanish, French, German, Chinese, Japanese, Hebrew, Ancient Greek, Latin, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, Russian, Arabic, and American Sign Language. So we have a, a commitment to the teaching of languages here. Did I forget anything, Kerry? Did I mention Russian? Russian's another one we teach as well. So we do, uh, we do really believe in the teaching of foreign language here, and we're very pleased to welcome you to this Kansas Language Symposium. Um, I know you have a great program today. I'm not going to uh, keep you too much from it anymore. So I would again welcome you on behalf of the college, and please let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Enjoy the show. Thanks. Good morning, and welcome to the Kansas Languages Symposium. I'm glad to see that uh, most of you have gotten over there to sample some of the food, so make sure that you do that throughout the day. I wanted to give you just a really brief uh, uh, overview of how we uh, developed this concept. I, um, I work in the uh, Educational Technology Center here at uh, Johnson County Community College, and uh, I have a background in, in German linguistics, and uh, a professor who I had at KU is sitting here with us, Bill Keel, who's our keynote speaker. And um, I went to Jim Liker about two years ago and said, it'd be great if we could have Bill Keel come out and, and talk about some of the research that he's doing in the German languages in Kansas. And, and Jim said, well, why don't we go talk to Kerry Stevenson over in the foreign language department and see if maybe we could broaden that out a little bit. And so we started talking about uh, having a, a wide geographic and cultural diversity of languages. So that was uh, how we ended up inviting Hector Martinez, and if you could just raise your hand, and uh, Mervat Ibrahim and Ed Smith, along with Bill Keel. So we would have uh, languages from uh, different parts of the world, different cultures. Uh, we did talk about, there's several other, other languages obviously spoken in Kansas, and you'll hear more about that today. I think you probably saw some of the posters out in the hallway. So we talked about, you know, should we do Swedish, Czech, Chinese, Italian, um, Russian, and I think, you know, there may be a future symposium where we do some of those things. So uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of an, of an overview of how we got there, and I'm really glad to see that the uh, Baser Linwood students are here today, so go Bobcats, and I uh, hope you enjoy the day. So thank you, and I think, Jim, you're going to come up and uh, introduce our first speaker. Our first session, which starts with one of the original indigenous languages of Kansas will be by Ed Smith. Ed is a Osage descendant and an associate with the Center for America, American Indian Studies here at Johnson County Community College. Ed earned his Bachelor of Arts in Indian Studies from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and he is currently completing his thesis for a master's in indigenous nation studies at the University of Kansas. And by the way, Ed, that was a very smart move going from Columbia to Lawrence. <laughs> so, glad to see you on the side of right and justice. So, Mr. Smith has been a student of the Osage language for a total of four years. Please welcome Ed Smith. Thank you, Jim. Howe, God say Adse Donnelly, Dahe Nixie, Jajawita Ed Smith. Um, I said good morning. My name is Ed Smith. Um, I'm an Osage descendant. Um, for some of you, that what that means basically is that I am I am native, but I am not enrolled. And there's a long history of that that we won't get into today, um, because I could take up the day probably talking about that um, <clears throat> and and what that means. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you today about is is the Osage language. Um, here in Kansas, but also um, the state of the language, what, what's going on with it today, um, and, and that importance to Kansas, um, importance to the tribe and the native communities. So who are the Osage? Um, they're a U.S. federally recognized American Indian nation. Okay, we changed our, our, um, our constitution to 
represent ourselves as a nation, um, not a tribe of people. Um, that gives us a legality of sovereignty um, status, okay, that we are a separate nation. There are many groups, um, many tribes, many nations in the United States, um, around 564, um, it changes sometimes up or down. But those are just federally recognized. That means the U.S. government recognizes us. Um, for those of you that are a little older, you realize the irony of sovereignty and then having the government recognize you. Um, that's just something when you're sovereign, you don't need recognition but your own. Um, their capital is in Pawhuska, Oklahoma. Um, Pawhuska is in uh, northeast Oklahoma. Um, it's a little town. Um, it was an oil town, and I say was because <laughs> there's not much there these days. Um, but then there's two other village, what we call villages or districts in that area. One is Hominy, and the other one is Greyhorse. And those three villages are how we identify each other um, as Osages. We talk about what district we're from. We used to have a clan system, but that is no more. Um, the villages are loosely associated with certain clans and with certain divisions, um, but much of that has been lost, especially because people move back and forth, they intermarry, things like that. There are approximately, excuse me, there are approximately about 16,000 Osages um, that are enrolled members of the tribe. That doesn't include the folks that are not enrolled, um, which would be, I would be one of them. Um, in 1906, we had a constitution that called for only members of the tribe, um, only those that had these head rights, these mineral rights, um, could be members of the tribe. Well, in about 2000, in about 2000, we realized that we had 12 people. Yeah, so there was a need for change, or we would basically be out of existence. And so um, thankfully we had some uh, support from the state of Oklahoma and we went to only a, a, a congressional act could help us with the uh, redoing our constitution and redoing the uh, enrollment or whatever. <laughs> Losing track here. <clears throat> so the, the uh, slide here is the Osage, what our Osage lands used to be, and that was for this uh, dark green area is for dominant control because we did go all the way to the Mississippi River in the east. Um, in the three times a year we would have buffalo hunts and we would go as far as the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then you'll notice um, parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas were, were in our uh, borders as well. Um, about half those tribes that you see listed here, the Quapaws, um, the Missourias, the Kansas, those are relatives of ours as well. So, so those lands extend even further if you count the areas that we could go. And then if you pay special attention, you'll notice that Johnson County is in that area. <clears throat> now the uh, nice red area here is, is what we have now. And it is the only recognized reservation in Oklahoma. There are trust lands in Oklahoma from other tribes. There are tribally controlled lands in Oklahoma. But the Osage Reservation is the only one that is left. And that is currently being contested as well from a treaty. Um, but presently, that's what we have. It is in our, in our uh, former boundaries. Um, the reason that that land is where it is um, is because we bought it. That's why we have the only recognized reservation left in Oklahoma. Even with allotment, um, the Osages took a separate act where allotment divided up lands, whatever was left went back to the government. It was a way to, to take more Indian land, basically. The Osages didn't accept allotment till years later, and it was a separate act that established the allotment for that tribe. Um, and so, we ended up purchasing that land. We bought it. 
And so that's why it's still within our control. And it's uh, the Osage Nation is actually set up um, like a corporation because of the oil that was found on the reservation lands. So background on the language. Um, we're part of the Degiha Suan language stock. Um, that also includes the Kansa, which Kansas is named after, the Omaha, Ponkas, and Quapaws. Um, those, of course, are not our names um, for themselves. We, the Kansa is. Um, but we call them Omaha, Ponca, and Ogakfa. Um, and those have a relationship with basically where we lived. The uh, Ogakfa is go, go with the current is what it means. Um, and that's talking, then I'll get to that in a minute. The, I'm rambling. We used to get on, we used to be one group. And so we came down from the Ohio. We weren't always in this area. We came down the Ohio River Valley. And somewhere around St. Louis, basically you get in an argument. Which way do you go? You go down the Mississippi, you go up the Mississippi. Well, the Quapaws wanted to go down, and that's where they went. And so that's where they say, we went with the current. You go, go with the flow. Um, and then the rest of us went up the Missouri River. When we came to the mouth of the Osage, we, of course, went down that river. And that's how it became known as the Osage River. Um, and that means children of the middle waters. We were kind of in between the, Os the Osage River, the Mississippi, the Missouri River, and so we're kind of in the middle of all these river areas. So that's what our traditional name is Neokonska, Children of the Middle Waters. Um, then the, who are today the Poncas, Omahas, and Kansa went up the Missouri River. The Kansa split off and went up the Kansas River about, not very far, about three miles. That river's named after them. The city's named after them. It was Kansas City. And so today we don't say Kansas City. We still pronounce it Kansas City um, very loosely. Those became the people of the wind. And then the Omahas and Poncas kept going up the Missouri River. <coughs> and they eventually split um, because of a domestic dispute. Um, and some adultery. <laughs> this is, is seriously what happened. Is some groups sided with this family, some groups sided with that family, and they split. And it happened in the middle of winter, and so the Poncas literally means they, they left with snow on their heads. They, they split off and went up there, and they actually st uh, lived, well, and some of them still do, near a town called Niabrora, or Niabrora, Nebraska. And the Omahas are in in uh, Macy, around Lincoln, that area. <coughs> so some background about the Osage in Kansas. Um, of course, Kansas was a part of our traditional land, so we were, we've been here a very long time. Um, some estimates say 1,600. Um, some of our oral traditions are going and some of the anthropological data or archaeological data now is, is saying it, it was much sooner than that. Um, and so we never went to war with the United States. Everything was done with treaties. Um, sometimes they were a little strong armed, um, as the case may be. But in this 1865 uh, Canville Trading Post Treaty, we basically got ceded all of our lands in Missouri and ended up in what they call the diminished reserve, which is this gray, or gray, yellow, <laughs> apparently I need glasses too, um, strip down here in Kansas with a little buffer because the folks in the settlers and everybody in Missouri didn't want us being too close um, to them. So we had this, this little area here. Now, of course, as you can imagine, we all know settlers and everything looking for farmland. Kansas is great farmland. So people were squatting on the Osage lands. We were complaining. They were complaining. So eventually, 
1865, once things were kind of looking positive um, after the Civil War, we decided to sell our land, sell that reservation to the United States. <laughs> and then we bought <clears throat> our own land from the Cherokees who had been put in Oklahoma into that little red area there. <clears throat> um, there's been some attempts, or there were some attempts, um, by several ethno uh, ethnographers um, and some linguists to preserve the language. Um, James Owen Dorsey was one of the first, um, but his a lot of his His definitions of the words were, were not accurate. So Francis LaFleche took his work and created the first Osage Dictionary. Francis LaFleche was Omaha. And so they, being part of that language stock, spoke the same language but a different dialect. And so a lot of people complain that LaFleche did an Osage dictionary, but it was, some of the words were the Omaha dialect. They weren't in our, in our dialect. And so, um, Carolyn Quintero came along, and she's a linguist, which <clears throat> is great for other linguists um, when she's writing some of these things um, and explaining sentence structure and things like that. But I myself, opening up that dictionary, kind of look at it and go, huh? Nobody understands half of what she wrote, um, unfortunately. So her dictionary is the most comprehensive, and it is in the correct dialect. Because um, out of those five tribes, we're the only tribe with an R that uses an R sound. Um, the rest of them have a, a replace that with a D sound. So there's issues with some of those, those early attempts. Um, a lot of that language loss had to do with um, missionization. It had to do with the boarding schools. And so the boarding schools basically were set up um, that the Osage children weren't allowed to speak the language. So over time, you had some students that resisted, um, and then you had others that, that uh, did forget the language. And those that, even those that resisted, they had a limited use of, of the language. Um, so that caused um, that generation or those generations of those boarding schools um, really had um, they did their job, that was, that was their intent, was to keep Native people, um, lose the language, lose the culture, um, things of that nature. And so the Osages actually asked for missions to be built in their reservation early on. And so that's why I say several generations, because it was even before Kansas was a state, um, even before Missouri was a state, we had, we had missions and mission schools um, on, the, uh, on the Osage Reservation or on Osage lands. <clears throat> By the 1940s, um, English was the predominant um, first language in most Osage homes. Osage was still being spoken at ceremonies. Um, it was still being spoken in the tribal offices for, for the Congress and things like that. Um, but English was predominant. In 2000, um, you know, nobody paid much attention in that, that 60 years about the language. You know, English was the first language for most folks. And so by 2000, somebody actually decided to look at this and realize there are only six fluent speakers left. Um, the Osage tribe in general is, is pretty progressive. They've done well for themselves. Um, and so they, they openly accepted 
you know, using this constitutional um, kind of a, a white model government. Um, they've always been, like I said before, they, they asked for the missions and the mission schools to come to their reservation pretty early on compared to most tribes. Um, and so all this stuff is unusual and kind of has led to their success as a people today. And so they really were concentrating on that, concentrating on the future as far as being successful in society. Um, you know, they had during World War I, they were the richest ethnic group in the entire world um, because people needed resources and there was a ton of oil in their land. So they did this study in 2000, found that there were six, they were all elders, those six, those six fluent speakers were all elders. None of the Osage children could speak Osage. They knew words. Um, very few could even understand what was being said to them. Um, so they uh, declared a state of emergency. And then shortly after, I actually have those flipped, shortly after they declared this emergency, four of those six people died. And so that, um, that just highlighted the situation um, even further. So in 2003, the 31st Osage Congress met and created the Osage Nation Language Program. And they put um, Mongrain Lookout in charge of it. Um, the interesting thing is um, we, everybody lovingly calls him Uncle Moog. Um, he wasn't a linguist, and he wasn't fluent. <laughs> um, it was very, very interesting, but he knew the culture, and he set about diligently trying to figure out what was the best way to preserve the language. Um, because essentially, <clears throat> with this language dying out, um, as I understand how linguists classify things, it was already a dead language. Because even though there was fluent speakers, none of the children were learning it. So if my understanding of, of that classification is correct, it was already dead because there was nobody else learning it. Um, it was well, it was already past the point of endangered or however um, some languages are classified. In 2005, just two years after the establishment of the program, um, Lucille Rubidoux passed away, and she was the last known fluent speaker of the, of the language. Um, so today, or 2006, um, they had language classes. There were some, basically some tapes, um, little cassette tapes. I don't know if you guys in the back even know what those are. Uh, <laughs> but it's pretty old, old school technology there. Um, and that was all they had, was a collection of words, um, a few phrases. And so a gentleman by the name of Steve Pratt, who is a communications professor in Oklahoma and also Osage, um, he, he and his mom made these tapes. And so it was just a collection of words. Um, nobody was using it. They, they sold it at the tribal office, but there really wasn't a whole lot being done. They had a little workbook going on. Um, and that's about it. So they got a little, later on, they got a little high tech, started developing curriculum, looking at how other tribes, um, like the Navajo and the Omahas, um, especially since the Omahas are related to us, how have they, they held on to their language? So they started looking at those things. And then by 2006, um, there were about 15 to 20 elders that could speak the language as a second language really well. But Uncle Moog was kind of saying, well, okay, we're, we're teaching these elders. That still doesn't help us because we're going to end up being in 2005 again. These folks are going to pass away and we're going to be back to where we started. And so they started talking about... Um, the curriculum, developing the curriculum further. They developed CDs 
um, put some things on the computer um, to try to get the younger kids involved. Um, I think they actually put, um, downloaded the language stuff on, on iPods and were giving them to the kids so they could just listen instead of reading, reading this, um, what they had developed, they used that. Um, then they had kind of a breakthrough and they realized that there are sounds that we have in Osage that aren't really in English, but maybe other languages. But the fact of the matter is, when you were reading these things using the alphabet, you were still processing up here in English. You were still translating in your head, and you weren't thinking in Osage. So in 2009, they, they got together um, with a gentleman in Canada and created this um, orthography. And orthography is, is a collection of, of symbols based on, on sounds, um, not, a, not any pairing of symbols like, a, like an alphabet is to, to get those sounds. And so um, today they have about three dozen advanced speakers. <coughs> and they found that, that those, um, that orthography really helped the students quit thinking in English, um, quit trying to translate things so they could, they could speak the language quicker, they could speak it faster, um, as that, I mean, process faster. So, <coughs> They have approximately two to 300 students each fall and spring go through the program. Um, and a lot of them now are kids. And so we get to um, start getting to the becoming a living language. It's not, it's not endangered or anything. They have young people learning it because um, that's what's important is that those young people become fluent in it and keep that language going and hopefully get well versed in the language to start teaching their kids um, when they get old enough. Here's an example of the orthography um, with some translations. So you guys could probably read that pretty good, huh? Um, <clears throat> and you can see it, it's loosely based on, on the alphabet um, that we use. Um, we have kind of blended sounds. We don't have a T, we don't have a D. It's kind of like water. It's spelled with a T, you pronounce it with a D. And so it's a, it's a little mix. Um, and that's, uh, oh wow, uh, kind of, I never felt short. What's going on right here? This little D with a tail, that's, that's what that sound is, like a TD. And then uh, BDs, we also have, um, or Bs and Ps are also an example of that. And of course, I don't have one of those on here. Um, SH, uh, KG blend. And so they got some like, uh, this word is uh, Nika. That's how that's spelled. A lot of tribes when they, or I guess not really the tribes, when anthropologists and, and linguists um, write Indian words down, it usually has a hyphen like in between the words. And one of the things that we do that's different and whenever I'm writing a paper, I always get called on it is, oh, what's this period, <laughs> period here? Um, and that's just a, a stop that they, that they use. Um, and so some of, some of the characters don't resemble anything like the, the little lightning bolt here is actually a wah sound. Um, so that's just an example of the, uh, the orthography now for the future, I already mentioned that the children are speaking it. <clears throat> um, some of the folks that were, uh, have been in language classes for five or six years, um, they're starting to teach their kids. And their kids, it's still not, hasn't got to the point where that's their first language. There's a lot to deal with. They're going to public schools where they're being spoken to in English all day long. Um, 
at home, since mom and dad aren't fluent speakers, they're, they're hearing it there. And so it's a long process. Um, we didn't lose the language in a short period of time, so it's not real likely that we're going to keep it um, in a short period of time or preserve it. And that's a, another point that when you're bringing a language back, you want to move beyond preservation. You can preserve it in a museum. When you have a workbook, you can preserve it. But to make it a living language, you have to be creating new words um, with new technology, like, like computer, for instance. We have a word for computer. Um, great. Now that you mention it. Basically, it means iron brain. That's what, that's what it's called. They call it the iron brain. And so we, we develop new words, but still based on this this Osage um, school of thought. Most of the words in our language are, are descriptive of things. Animals, when we named animals, it was descriptive of how that animal acts, um, things like that. And so, so most of our, our language is, is descriptive when we're naming things. Um, our word for money is manzeska. Well, the old, the traders and everything, if they had any coins, they were usually silver. And so to us, in the sunlight, it was white. And that's what it means, is white metal. Manzeska. Um, <clears throat> last, two years ago, um, they started teaching Osage in the schools um, down in Oklahoma. And these aren't, these aren't um, tribal schools. These are public schools around the reservation. Um, and so they started teaching, um, having their language instructors go to the schools and teach the kids. So that was, um, that was a big step for us, for the tribe. Um, they're working on developing online courses. Um, and that's something that I always complained about because they had language classes um, in each of the three districts in Hominy, Paul Huska, and in Greyhorse but, or they're related towns. Um, you won't find Gray Horse. I think you can Google it and find Gray Horse on a map, but it's, look for Fairfax if you wanna know where that is. <laughs> they have, they had the Osage towns and then next to it was White Town. And so, except for Paul Huska. Paul Huska was, was pretty much, um, pretty well integrated. But they're trying to do some online courses because I was always saying, well, that's great that you have these classes, and that's, you know, wonderful, but there's 16,000 Osages. They don't live in Oklahoma. They're all over the country. There's a huge population of Osages in California, um, so much so that they have a Northern California organization that's the Northern California Osages, and they have a Southern group of Southern California Osages, and when it's time for tribal elections, the delegates go to California. There's that many people there, so they, they go, to, uh, go to get the votes. Um, so they were, they're still developing these online courses. Um, in the last year, they finally put the language materials on their website. They had a language page that had a history. Um, it had, a, had the... Uh, orthography so you could they're trying to switch everybody over to that but of course the older folks are used to that the alphabet and and the hyphenated breaks and things like that and so they were kind of like oh great you know now we have to learn something else and going back to Quintero that was another issue was that she didn't use the orthography um, actually her book came out before the orthography was was developed but she made her own and so then it was like, oh great, now we gotta learn another way to, to say our language or how this person's writing it. Um, and I still have a written key that when I'm looking at her dictionary, I have to look back and forth, like what's this, the, what's this symbol stand for and things like that. So that's the problem with a lot of native languages. If a lot of people are studying it, they're gonna choose what makes sense to them how to write it because we didn't write we didn't have a alphabet we had a we spoke everything songs words history 
And so that's been a problem for the, the preservation of native languages is that we don't have it written down. And if somebody has a dictionary, then that's helpful. But when the next person comes along and works on it, what do you, you know, what do you do? Then you have to relearn something, write their way, um, and things like that. And so that's a, that's a problem for um, some native, native languages. Um, today, we're hearing it at ceremonies again. Um, one of our biggest ceremonies is the Enlaska. And that's a, a set of dances that we have in June. Um, and there's a town crier that's in there, and that person is usually Ponca, and he's speaking Ponca, but, and we should know what he's saying, but a lot of the, the kids don't, and a lot of the adults don't either, actually. It's, it's people that are my age and younger that are really filling up the language classes. There's a few older folks in there, but a lot of them are just kind of like, well, I'm, I'm too old to be messing with this right now, and so they, or they're too busy, or they just, they've gotten through life without it. And so for many years, you weren't hearing Osage spoken at our traditional ceremonies. Um, but just this, this uh, past year, there was a few people, um, gotta love Facebook. There was some uh, people talking about how these little kids were talking in Osage. They were just playing. Um, but I was at the Gray Horse Dance this year, and the people that I stayed with, um, he was the only one on, on Sunday they sing family songs. And they'll call people up and give them gifts and things like that. Um, he was the only person that day that called all his people up in Osage. The only one. And so that was cool for me to hear. Um, I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, it was a little sad, too, because this, it's a whole day of dancing and calling people up to give gifts and everything, and he was the only one that was able to do that. Um, a neat thing for the orthography, the, the language department really pushes this orthography. Um, the street signs are being, you have the kind of the, what I say, the English version, so like a, a Kihega Street is, means chief. Um, you have the KI-HE-GA um, street sign, but then underneath it, it has it in the orthography, so people can start learning that. The uh, tribal offices, their signs are the same way. It has it in English for everybody else, for those that don't know, and then underneath, it uses the orthography. That would be really cool if they flipped it, but then everybody get lost. <coughs> Um, the license plates include the orthography. Nothing fancy. They haven't switched the letters or anything because then we'd get pulled over by Oklahoma Highway Patrol or something all the time. And it'd be really hard if you ran a red light and somebody said, oh, this guy, I don't know, how do you say that on, you know, license plate number or oh, whatever. They wouldn't, there's no names for those <laughs> orthography symbols. So, um, but it just basically says, Wajaje Nikashe. Wajaje is our, our, uh, name that we've had that got screwed up, and uh, then Nikashe is, is people. Um, in 2011, I, and this is how I got kind of involved with this conference, um, we had the first ever Degiha conference. I mentioned before that the five tribes had split, you know, hundreds of years ago. This conference was such an emotional time. We were getting together to see how each other had preserved the language. And unfortunately, the cause are they don't have a language anymore. They have to, um, they're trying to, re the older people are trying to remember as much as they can and work with the other tribes to, to bring it back from being totally gone. Um, but they, uh, this conference was really great because this is the first time in 500 years that we had come together as five tribes to work on a single, to have a single mission. Um, and so that was really great. It was a very emotional time. A lot of the older folks were in tears, giving speeches. Um, 
things like that. It was, uh, it was good to see, that's for sure. And they talk about, you know, kind of this whole prophecy type of situation where our elders told us that one day we were going to come back and, and get together and do things as a people. And, you know, they were, some of them saw that it's like, this is, this is that day, this is that time. Um, and the conference went well. It was a start. Um, they had another one this year. And unfortunately, I couldn't attend that um, <coughs> due to uh, a death in the family. But not only are we keeping the conference going, but now they're going to establish a 501c3 um, for the preservation of the Degiha language. And so they're coming together, talking about it as one, one language um, with different dialects. And uh, it's very, very interesting. There's a lot of comparisons. And of course, as long as we've been split, there's a lot of differences in words too. And so what we've decided to do is to keep the languages alive is kind of come together. And when something happens like the iPad, then we come together as a group to create that word. So it's not just somebody saying, oh, it's you know the computer's the iron brain. The rest of you guys follow suit. <laughs> um, but to come together and get the elders together and, and create those words. One of the funniest things that my kids like is that um, it just means the place where you shop, but we have a word for Walmart. Um, and so, but if you knew Indians in Walmart, you would not be surprised. <laughs> we made Walmart. No. <laughs> but uh, right now, uh, for Kansas, you know, I mentioned, you know, back in 1870, we had the 65 Treaty, and I totally forgot about it. 1872 is when we left Kansas. Um, so that was, document-wise, that was probably the last time that Osage was spoken a lot in Kansas. But we have tribal stories that say that when we left Missouri, not everybody left. When we left Kansas, not everybody left. Because um, we didn't have like a trail of tears like you would, like the, the Cherokee or a long walk like the Navajo. Basically what happened is, it was the fall, 1872. We went out for our buffalo hunt. When we came back, we didn't go back to Kansas. We just went to Oklahoma. And so, so everybody was kind of there. There was a few people that, that stayed behind. And you got to realize in that little strip at the bottom of Kansas, there, was, there were towns around there. So a lot of the Osages just made a place for themselves there. Um, but nobody knows what happened to those families. They're not, you know, I mentioned the 1906 rolls. Um, not everybody's on those rolls. That's a really late roll. There are other Osage rolls that were taken in Kansas, um, but that's the one they, they chose to go with um, in the new constitution. Right now, there's about 12 Osage families um, in Kansas that are teaching it, um, or learning it and teaching it. Um, they didn't make it. I invited them but they work. <laughs> Some of them are in school. Um, but yeah, there's about, there's about a, a dozen families that are teaching it to their kids. Um, a couple, there's a gentleman that's a language instructor for the tribe, or a former one, that now works over at Haskell for the time being. And we're trying to get a, a class started because a lot of us, um, I've taught myself. Um, and that's why I was complaining about having an online course and how everything was, oh, that's great that you're teaching it there, but there's all these Osages that, you know, there's 16,000, as I said before, and maybe 6,000 of them, maybe, live on or around that reservation area. The majority of them are just spread out all over the place. So that's, that's our future, is that these kids are learning it, um, we're using it, the, uh, Oh, where is that? We're going to go hyperspeed. This is a font. This is, you can download this font for free from the Osage Nation webpage. And so that's why my PowerPoint is in a PDF, because when I 
turn it and put it on a, another computer, I get the squiggly lines and the happy faces and everything. <laughs> My wife told me what that was called, but I can't remember. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's what it ends up, is all this, this nonsense. And so there, ha there, has a, there is a font, and I, there is a, uh, they gave you a keyboard map, so you can kind of put it in front of your keyboard and figure it out. We haven't quite got as cool as the uh, Cherokees, and they have, uh, you can text in Cherokee, because they're another tribe that has a, they were the first tribe to have a written language and make a, a written alphabet. Um, and you can, uh, there's an app you can buy so that they can, they're, they're really uh, progressive. You can text other Cherokees, well, or anybody that understands it, I guess, in Cherokee language. But I don't know if they have a, they have a font. So we, we have a nice little font here. Um, that's pretty cool. It also keeps you from trying to write that, that thing out. But that's, um, that's where we're at so far, from almost uh, extinct language to, to bringing it back and having these at least um, second language speakers um, and the youth, the youth speaking Osage.